Welcome to today's webinar, which is co-hosted by Chapter Zero and Fidelio. The theme is the role of the REM co-chair and in particular defining KPIs for the E in ESG. And I'm delighted to be joined today by a panel which will help us shed light on the practicalities and challenges of this um, key task, I think, for boards uh, in, at this time. Um, our, our panelists are Richard Gillingwater, Julie Baddeley, and Susan Hooper. Um, Pauline van der Meermore was to be with us, but sadly is not unwell and sends her apologies. Um, but I think we have a very experienced um, uh, panel today covering a range of sectors. And so I'm looking forward um, to a very um, insightful discussion. Uh, next chart, please. Julie will say a few words about chapter zero. But let me just perhaps set the scene for one of these, one of the most uh, significant challenges that I think um, boards are facing today. ESG has certainly been high on the board agenda. I mean, we see that with Infidelio and over the past three or four months, our focus um, has been very firmly on helping boards um, embrace ESG and embed it into um, their strategy, uh, their composition. And one of the key areas, without a doubt, is remuneration. It's perhaps been striking that during lockdown, there has still been significant discussion about how to link remuneration uh, with ESG and with environmental targets in particular. Next slide, please. And if we look at remuneration, um, over the past decade, it's perhaps been the hot seat or the Remco chair has perhaps been the hot seat in terms of um, board roles. Post the financial crisis, um, there was real scrutiny of executive pay um, and um, it's a main lever for investors without a doubt. And here we've just grouped a range of headlines. It's also a very popular subject for the press um, where you can see the evolution from fat cat pay to a focus on aligning executive compensation with the stated targets of the company, including around um, climate change. And I think one of the most significant changes we've seen has taken place over the past um, uh, two years where we saw significant negative votes at 2018 AGMs, in particular in the um, oil and gas sector, to the extent that now most of the oil and gas majors do indeed have explicit linkage between um, their executive pay and carbon reduction targets. Um, and indeed, investors have played a crucial role here. Uh, next slide, please, Ben. This is also moving very quickly. And I think one of the themes that will come out of today's discussion is the pace of change. Um, here we've just looked at three company, countries and you can see these snapshots in 2019, the Netherlands pulling well ahead, the US quite surprisingly high, but I think reflecting already the fact that ISS had picked up on um, carbon uh, decarbonisation as, 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 as um, an important metric for management. And the UK back then only at 6% um, of, of, of the, um, uh, the FTSE were explicitly linking pay um, to um, carbon reduction uh, and ESG targets more broadly. However, roll on a year and in 2020, you see that already a third of the FTSE were now linking um, executive pay to an ESG metric. And about half of these um, were directly climate related metrics. So within the course of eight, 12 months, um, we're seeing very significant change um, in this area. Uh, next chart, please. And part of this, as I've mentioned, is driven by um, the regulator, the, the, the underpinning of the code, but we're certainly seeing a very active investor voice. I know Elgin was speaking yesterday on a Chapter Zero webinar um, very explicitly about what they're looking for in terms of um, the board response to climate change and remuneration is clearly one of those sectors, uh, segments. And similarly, the World Economic Forum has very explicitly set out um, uh, remuneration as, as one of the principles of climate change governance and something that is absolutely within the gift of boards and something that boards should be focusing upon. Next slide, please, Ben. And if we look to 
just a snapshot of where um, Fidelio has seen the emphasis land. One, we are certainly seeing that one board after another is, is um, looking to embed climate change um, and ESG in um, its strategic decision making, resource allocation, um, its um, uh, composition and in its remuneration. And, and certainly in that journey towards ESG leadership, remuneration plays a very significant role. Um, and I know our speakers are going to go into more detail about the process and also the outcomes, um, but just some of the um, characteristics that we've identified uh, in terms of environmental KPIs. The, you know, the, they need to be independently verified, the opportunity for science-based um, metrics, um, critically important, relevant and within remit. So something that management can relate to and influence. And I know a theme that will be picked up during this discussion, evolving. We're seeing the pace of change here move very fast. Uh, and so being able to work from a blank um, piece of paper, but also to think ahead. So now I'd like to move on to um, a poll question. So a question for our participants. And very simply, uh, we'd like to know, does your company um, have specific KPIs related to decarbonisation? A, yes. B, KPIs related to broader ESG metrics. C, no ESG KPIs, but currently under discussion. And D, no current plans. So I'm afraid the, um, the panel can't vote, but the participants can. Uh, so we look forward to, um, to seeing how you vote on this. So perhaps unsurprisingly, the greatest, the, the biggest bucket is no, but currently under discussion. <laughs> but actually almost 20% do have KPIs related to decarbonization, which I think is, is very positive. And almost 30% um, will have, K, which is very consistent with the figure that we showed before, uh, have KPIs related to broader ESG metrics. And 20% no current plans. So I think that sets the scene, a very broad spectrum there. And um, I'd like to move on now to our first speaker and to welcome um, Julie back. Here's the panel of all our speakers. And if we could perhaps move on, Ben, to the, uh, the next chart. So Julie is the chair of Chapter Zero and will say a few words about Chapter Zero uh, and is um, also through her Hughes Hall commitments, very active in the climate change uh, arena, but also an exp very experienced um, independent director. She's the Sid of Marshall of Cambridge Holdings, uh, REM co-chair of Ubiquity, non-executive chair of uh, Chrysalis BCT, and has sat on many boards before this. And so, Julie, if I may, over to you, please. Thank you. Um, so what I thought I'd do is just very, very briefly introduce Chapter Zero um, and um, welcome everyone on behalf of, of our network. Um, quite a lot of the people on the call will already be members of Chapter Zero, but for anyone who isn't, if you um, have a look at the website, we would love you to join us. Um, we are a network set up by non-execs for non-executive directors. Um, and our aim is to help promote an informed climate conversation in the boardroom um, and from that to lead to um, effective risk assessment, opportunity assessment, net zero strategies where that's um, appropriate. Um, and so um, I would like to just tell you a little bit about how we go about doing that. If we could go to the next slide, please. We've been going for a year, which is not very long, and we have um, touching a thousand members um, in that time. So it shows how interested the non-execs are in this as a topic. Um, and what we do is to provide a lot of networking, toolkits, events, and um, content sharing amongst our members. And as you can see from the slide, we've got a, a very um, serious group of chairs of companies, including Richard, who's on our call today, um, who are supporting us and also organizations that are active in this area. So um, it's been a good year for our um, inaugural period. And the next slide, please. Um, so we're not just a, a UK outfit, we, uh, Chapter Zero, work with UK listed company directors, um, but we're also part of a global um, movement 
Uh, and I think I'm quite proud to say that I think the UK is leading the way on this um, and has helped to support the development of uh, chapters um, which are either launched or being um, put together in the countries that you can see at the bottom of that slide. Um, and fundamental to what we do are the, the World Economic Forum principles of climate governance. And Gillian has already mentioned the fact that incentivization, which is the topic for today, is one of those key principles. So my final slide, if I may, Ben. Um, we do believe that business has to get us out of this mess, frankly. Um, we don't think that we can wait for regulation. Um, we don't think we can really wait for consumers because um, business needs to be able to give consumers choice. So we, as a network, fundamentally believe that business can help solve the climate emergency through its fantastic track record in innovation, adaptation, um, and that we have it within our power to uh, reduce emissions. So if I then move on to the, the remuneration topic that we've been talking about, um, as, as we've said, um, it's an, a key part of the principles that we, um, we adhere to. Um, and I think one of the most difficult. So I'm gonna share with you some of my thoughts on why this is a tough challenge for us all. Um, uh, as to, at Chapter Zero, um, our key is to help non-execs navigate climate impacts for their companies. Um, and to do that, they need strategies and robust plans to hit the net zero emissions targets. They need to be able to do effective risk assessments. They need to report meaningfully, and they need to be able to justify their capital projects through a low carbon lens. Um, I, I've chaired a lot of Remco's in my time, I'm afraid for my sins, um, ranging from FTSE 100 through to sort of private businesses. Um, and what I've experienced during that time is that um, the setting targets of any sort for variable pay is challenging. All too often, I've found, we've got to the end, we've looked back on the year and the payouts that we've had both for long-term plans and annual bonuses actually, have not always been what we would have liked to have seen had we been setting those targets in retrospect. It's not easy. Um, circumstances change and we only have to see the COVID situation at the moment to see how that's sort of put a cart and horses really through all our variable pay systems. And if you put the ESG hat on and the E part in particular, some of the arguments that we've spent a load of time in Remco's going over over the years I've been involved, such as, you know, is EPS or TCR the right target for long term incentive plans? They all seem a bit trivial, really, a bit spurious, because actually the targets that you need for incentivizing good environmental action um, is uh, just much more difficult to put in place. So investors tell us what they're looking for. They want sustainable businesses. They want good purpose and strategic views from the board. They want measurable targets. They want dividends and they want financial performance. But unfortunately, it's not always possible to have all of these things at the same time while we're going through the changes required. And the changes we see at chapter zero that are required for business are profound. I mean, they really do touch every aspect of the business. And you only have to look at BP's recent announcements and BMW to see how fundamental that is. So from a Remco point of view, I believe that we as Remco chairs and members need to be brave enough to create incentives which reward the right things. And even if they're not all measurable in the traditional sense of the world, that's, prob word, that's probably quite controversial and we may get onto that later, but I think we need a new scorecard and we need to recognize that the changes um, required by organizations will affect everyone in those organizations. The precise targets will vary hugely by sector and some will be more measurable than others. But as a Remco chair, what I'm looking for is a clearly thought out strategy based on sensible scenarios, delivering against the UK net zero, net zero outcome and a robust plan to put that in place. Clear evidence that risk assessment has been tackled based on evidence and input from all parts of the business. Achievement of short term carbon emission targets as part of an overall plan and that will be measurable and achievement of key milestones in the strategy. And for the CFO, it's about partly about reporting and um, adoption of TCFD is a really good indicator. 
So that would be my sort of headlines and just a couple of final concluding points. Some of these will have to fit within an executive's personal objectives, I think, um, because I'm not sure that we can um, put them across the board in a, in a measurable enough fashion. Um, and some fit more naturally within an annual bonus and some in the long-term incentive plans, but it will depend by company. So um, I think we just need to learn some of the lessons. We've, we've tackled this one with the health and safety agenda over many, many years. Um, and perhaps we can have the same success in embedding ESG in the DNA of companies um, and reflecting the incentives that we need to have to drive this transition because companies are on a journey and it's up to us to help develop those approaches that are suitable and deliver a resilient organization. So um, those would be my thoughts, Gillian, um, and I'm sure we'll have lots of Q&A to follow up. Thank you. And uh, on that note, um, if you do have questions, we've got a few coming in, but please do send them so that we've got time to, um, to, to, to address them. Um, and a number of themes addressed by Julie there, um, including sort of perhaps lessons to be learned from previous challenges that boards have tackled um, through remuneration. I'd like to now turn to um, Richard and um, SSE is one of the companies that we, we'd mentioned that clearly does have uh, KPIs in this space and specifically linked to decarbonisation as well. Um, and Richard, I guess you also um, are, are the chair of uh, Janice Henderson, which is quite interesting. So wearing a, a, a different perspective on this. Um, uh, Richard, can you take us through how as a chair you've overseen this process of, of starting with a blank piece of paper and, and, and figuring out what are the levers, what are the KPIs that are going to incentivize the behaviors that you're trying, that you're seeking to promote? Yeah, I'm very happy to. And let me also just say how um, pleased I am that I've been invited to join this panel and have this opportunity. Um, I'm going to uh, essentially um, focus most of my comments um, in the context of SSE, because I think that is more interesting and more relevant to this um, conversation. And I thought actually just before I uh, discuss the specifics of how we went on this journey, I might give a bit of context because actually um, sort of laying out how we arrived at um, wanting to have very solid links to the E of ESG is partly a process of um, major strategy review and, and quite a big strategy change. So just if I can give a couple of minutes of context on SSE first, um, and some may know, but others may not, we are um, an energy company operating in the UK and Ireland. Uh, we generate um, electricity, supply gas, operate electricity transmission and distribution infrastructure, and we also sell energy to businesses um, but we recently sold our retail supply business so we're not no longer in the retail customer business um, and i guess we've been on um, quite a big journey from certainly when i got involved with the board when we were essentially um, a very large uh, generator with a large retail business, retail supply business, and a sort of um, nascent transmission business in, um, up in Scotland uh, and, and distribution business. That a lot of um, that generation business, almost all of it was coal fired. And we were, at that point in time, we were, we still are one of the major generators, but we were um, certainly in the top two or three of the largest um, coal-fired generators. Um, we, I won't go into all the ins and outs of our, our strategy review and conclusions, but, but basically we've, we've gone through quite an intense process and we've essentially decided as a group that we're going to focus on um, essentially two things really, generating renewable energy um, and developing and building and operating uh, the infrastructure that transmits electricity both from Scotland south and um, in our distribution areas. 
<clears throat> and I, you know, I think um, from virtually a standing start in 2010, we've now got probably the largest renewables business in the UK, if you take our wind and our um, hydro business together. And I, I think it is genuinely fair to say that, that a lot of the renewables development has happened up in Scotland and up in the north of Scotland, not just by us, but by a whole range of developers. And we have brought that uh, electricity south uh, into the main national grid network and our nascent transmission network up there um, has grown uh, very, very significantly in order to be able to cope with that. So I think that that strategy now sort of grounds us uh, very clearly in uh, wanting to be part of uh, the uh, decarbonisation uh, agenda in the UK and particularly uh, to be very much part of the, um, the, the, the various green initiatives that the government is currently working on and launching as part of a response to, uh, to COVID. When we, so we articulated that strategy, we have been, um, we've organizationally uh, changed ourselves to deliver that. That's involved a very, very significant overhaul of the organization. Um, and we sat down and we thought, well, what sort of um, key goals do we want to set ourselves? What sort of, um, I hate this expression, but in business school terms, uh, what BHAGs, B, big, hairy, audacious goals do we want to set ourselves? And we, in the end, it, it boiled down to four goals. And we wanted those um, to have some resonance with UN sustainable development goals as well. So we, after a lot of debate, we came up with four big goals, three uh, climate environment related and one S, social related. Um, and those were, uh, first of all, a decarbonization target. So we've, in 2010, we set ourselves a target of reducing our carbon emissions by 50% by 2018. Uh, and we achieved that and we've gone again. And we've said that we want to uh, cut our carbon emissions in their entirety by our carbon intensity by 50%. Uh, so probably that's the key one that we look at, which drives a lot of our planning and our business behavior. But within that, um, we wanted to set ourselves a goal, particularly uh, to support the offshore wind and renewable initiatives in the country. And so we have said to ourselves, we'd like to treble the amount of renewable capacity we have in SSE by 2030, so in the next 10 years. Um, and we would also like to play a part in uh, further developing the resilience of our transmission and distribution infrastructure, and particularly to facilitate um, electric vehicle charging. Uh, and that means a lot more than just putting charging points into a street. Um, and I think it's people like us that have to do um, probably quite a lot of the heavy lifting there. So we've committed to essentially playing our part in um, helping uh, the country reach a target of 10 million electric vehicles by 2030. That, that's our best guess of where we hope we'll be. And then the final, um, the final goal we set ourselves was um, regarding being um, a sort of leading proponent of fair tax and um, a leading proponent of paying the living wage uh, in the energy industry, uh, both of which have been part of our policy now for a very long time. So those were our big four goals. And then we sat down as a board and we, we said to ourselves, well, how do we give them bite and how do we uh, incentivize our executive leadership um, 
in the context of those goals. And we, we decided that what we would do is essentially make um, quite a decent proportion of their variable pay, their bonus, their annual bonus, um, contingent on achieving progress against those targets. Um, and so um, basically we decided we'd link 20% of the annual bonus at SSC just for the executive directors and members of Exco to those four uh, big targets. And then as I think Julie uh, hinted in her, uh, in her introduction, uh, the challenge really came in terms of then, well, how do we, how do we measure progress? How do we really understand that we are making progress um, against those, those particular targets? We've had one year of operation. We've laid out, I think, in a very transparent way in our report and accounts, how we think we've done on that. So um, not universally good, um, some very good and some uh, less impressive for various reasons. Um, but it's all there, clear uh, and to be read. Um, and I think uh, in terms of a first year of operation, we've, we've judged progress at around 75% of the target. Um, uh, given that we had an exceptional year in terms of our um, winning of various CFD auctions to get new offshore wind projects. So that, that, that was the uh, way in which these targets um, came into being. I would say that um, essentially trying to sort of articulate the detail, the granular detail of how we feel comfortable progress is being made has been the major challenge. And that's where in the Remco we've spent uh, all the real time. Um, and I think the other thing that's very fair to say is that we, you know, we're very much keeping um, how we assess these under review as well. One last thing to say in terms of the um, the climate, the carbon reduction target, we challenged ourselves again. We've just gone through a process of signing up to the um, science-based target initiative, which has been unusually complex and far more onerous than I think we, we thought. Uh, but we've now gone through that and we've got um, essentially the, the, the blessing of that initiative. Um, and we've decided in the light of that to reduce the carbon intensity of our operations by 60%, not 50%. Um, uh, and that will be the new target we will look to measure against um, going forward. That's probably enough from me. Um, and obviously, when it comes to questions, I'm very, very happy to try and answer any. Thank you, Richard. Um, and a number of um, extremely um, interesting points, obviously, the, 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 the genesis of the, 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 the programme, but also that ongoing learning, which I think is something that we'll um, come back to. Um, and as Richard said, um, please do um, use the Q&A function um, on, on, on Zoom. Uh, we have some questions coming in and we do have time for questions at the end. Uh, thank you. Um, and now um, I'd like to move to, um, to Susan. Um, Susan, um, thank you very much for being with us today. Um, Susan, is, Susan Hooper is uh, uh, also um, a, a steering committee member and board member of Chapter Zero. Um, she's um, a, a REM co-chair of Affinity Water, uh, a non-executive director of Uber, uh, and she's also a non-executive director and safely, safer gambling committee chair of the Rank Group and chair of Care Saucer. Um, Susan, a wide range of, 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 of sectors, and you've sat on uh, a, a number of uh, remuneration committees and chaired remuneration committees. Um, can you share with us your perspective of, on how you've gone about in different companies at different stages of development, um, this process of evolving uh, in, environment, ESG KPIs and in particular environmental KPIs? Yes, hi, thank you. Thanks Gillian and thanks to Fidelio and to our own Chapter Zero. Um, for uh, inviting me today. And by the way, just before anyone notices, uh, that picture of me is before COVID and this is after COVID. I had a bit of a, 
um, a need for change after five months of lockdown. So um, today I wanted to really talk from my own perspective about the observations um, and thoughts that I've gathered and garnered uh, across a number of different boards, um, all of whom are grappling in some form or other with this topic. So we all know that including meaningful measurements and executive REM packages uh, can change behavior and outcomes, and that's what we want. Um, however, coming up with the right KPIs to incentivize these outcomes on climate change specifically is an immense challenge. Just to you know, summarize a few, there's no precedent for climate change. There are no real best practices yet. Every company, every industry is different. There is no one size fits all solution. Um, the near term targets are not yet clear. Uh, for now, they can either be too easy to achieve, already part of a strategy and incentive package, impossible to reach uh, given current understanding of technological developments and fledgling innovations, and it's extremely easy to greenwash in this situation. And I guess I'm, not, I'm speaking to the converted on all of this, forward planning has never been more challenging than it is today. Um, Julie mentioned already that this time last year, um, when, when we were starting up Chapter Zero, um, we barely had sustainability on most board agendas, let alone integrated into corporate strategy. And at least now I'd say it's mostly on the agenda, and, and Julian showed a couple of stats on that. Um, and I would attribute that largely to investor activity in the past 12 months or more, um, plus the looming requirement of reporting. Um, but there's still very varying executive leadership on this topic, um, which means that putting meaningful KPIs into a REM package can be extremely challenging. Um, it's a very different experience, and I've had both. Um, if your CEO gets it or if they don't, and it's really refreshing to hear of Richard um, and his experience as chair of SSE, um, you know, working on KPIs is infinitely easier in a situation like that. But sadly, I wouldn't say that that's yet standard practice. I think another observation is I'm, I'm struck by the fact that there's a lot more progress on disclosure than um, on meaningful and well thought through sustainability strategies. And maybe, maybe it's because the reporting is black and white and simply a decision as to what to report on and track. Um, and it's a good thing too, because focusing on reporting and disclosure certainly has helped get climate change onto the agenda. Uh, there's no question about it. However, in my mind, the lack of meaningful strategies on this topic is the single biggest hurdle to creating KPIs, which will move the dial uh, over the next five years and not by 2050, because that's irrelevant really in our career time. Um, and defining the strategy for transition uh, to a sustainable busy, uh, business is, is clearly not easy. And Richard has laid out a lot of the, um, the decisions that needed to be made uh, in SSE. Um, there are many big choices, not just choices, big choices. There are many hard decisions and there are significant trade-offs to be made. You know, do we go for net zero, carbon neutral, net negative? Do we measure total emissions or emissions per customer? Do we even know what our company's carbon footprint is? Um, have we taken into account all scope, one, two, and three? And if we don't reach net zero, do we need to offset? What about carbon offsetting? Uh, should we be investing in new technologies if we can't hit meaningful targets in the short term? And what of all of the above is going to add up to the right thing for our stakeholders and the environment? So the reality is it's new for everyone. Very few have taken this to a meaningful point yet. Um, but that means choosing the right KPIs are not going to be clear until you have a strategy, very simply put. And even then, the puzzle pieces are going to be moving all the time. I think Julie touched on the need for change there too. So my summary of the lesson so far on this journey, and I do see it as a journey, and I think actually if you were to ask me next week, I'd probably have moved on again because it's changing so quickly. But first and foremost is, and I, I excuse me, because I'm probably preaching to the converted on this one, but inform yourself on the topic. I know many of you are Chapter Zero members. Thank you for that. Um, and you are clearly doing that already, but I cannot underline um, that one enough. You don't have to be an expert. I'm far from an expert, but you have to have confidence and competence on the topic because ultimately as a non-exec, you'll be stress testing for meaningfulness, you know, the material, quantifiable, and do, does it reflect on the strategic priorities? Um, I believe BlackRock is actually requiring that KPIs need to be quantifiable, transparent, and auditable. 
And to be honest, greenwashing could be more detrimental to the business than no KPIs at all. Uh, little plug for chapter zero, director's climate journey would massively help any of those on any of the topics that we've been discussing today. Um, you pick and choose depending on your stage on the learning curve. But secondly, and for me, the most important thing, in, in, and this has come up from a number of us is, show me the plan, insist that there is a well thought through strategy that's an integral part of the business plan. Without a strategy, you haven't a hope of defining meaningful KPIs. The contribution to ESG performance does not start with pay, it starts with strategy. So assuming you've got that, <laughs> I would say from a Remco chair perspective, I do believe that you need to, the third point I want to make is you need to prepare for ongoing change and the use of judgment, a lot of judgment. Julie touched upon this, but you need to set up the ability to adapt and develop the KPIs over time. There's simply no way you can know now what is going to be needed in the next three to five years, let alone, you know, 2050. We're all on a very steep learning curve. We all are too. And I think we should be taking comfort by that fact as well. And we need to, under, uh, to adapt as we, as we understand more. We, we've got to include the learnings as we get them. Um, you know, it sounds a bit highfalutin, but uh, this is a new era and consequently new approaches to exec pay will have to be developed. So advice from me is get the best possible KPIs in now into your REM plans, but prepare exec and non-execs for frequent reviews and understand the need for change going forward until you're able to be more prescriptive. We can't be prescriptive right now. I think it's going to be a roller coaster ride over the next couple of years, um, which I quite enjoy because I feel much more in the driver's seat than I think as a non-exec I have in the past. And with the levers that the REM committee has, it really does stand to make a meaningful impact and contribution to the outcome on this topic. So observation from me. Thank you very much, Jillian. Thank you, Susan. Uh, and again, um, some quite interesting thoughts there. Uh, one about the sort of um, uh, the, the opportunity for REM co-chairs to make a real impact. Um, again, that emphasis on, on learning and revision and, 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 and development. Uh, and um, I, I, I think the, the, you know, the, the, the thing that struck me was very much that link between we're seeking science-based targets, but there's a lot of judgment and you know, it's, it's the science and the art of getting uh, this right and moving forward. Now we have a number of questions from the floor, and so I'm going to move um, straight to the Q&A. Um, and the first question I'd like to take um, is for Richard. And um, the question is, do you use TCFD to report? And would you recommend science-based targets initiative a process that you described to others having been through it? <laughs> mm. uh, well, the, the, so the answer on TCSD is yes. And we've been um, reporting in a sort of shadow way on that for the last two or three years. And then uh, we've um, tried to report very fully and to the full standard of TCFD in the last set of report and accounts. Uh, in terms of science-based, um, the science-based initiative, that's a tricky one because I think we found meeting the standards that they uh, set quite a challenge. And I'm not, I don't want to imply that uh, any degree of arrogance in this at all, uh, but we've had quite a keen focus on uh, all sorts of measures of um, our carbon emissions now for many years, and we still struggled to um, persuade them uh, that our plans would, would meet the requisite standards. So I think in a way you have to be um, a judge of where your organization is in terms of how it reports on meeting um, carbon emission targets and the, 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 the quality of the way in which it meets that. And then if the answer to that is a degree of confidence, then yes, please, I would strongly recommend going forward. I think I'm right in saying that there are still very few, even large European energy groups uh, that meet uh, the science-based target initiative. Uh, so that might say something. Uh, I don't know whether anyone else, um, there are, I think, one or two um, colleagues on this call from the energy industry.
Oh, we've just lost. Richard, I just lost your there. Did, did you want to repeat just the last bit of that sentence? Yeah, um, just just to say that there, uh, there might be some um, energy colleagues on the on the call who you know might have experience themselves of um, going through the science based initiative target process. Thank you. And if, if, if so, please just use the actually the Q&A function rather counterintuitively to, 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 to share that with us. Um, I have a, a very different type of question. Um, this is about the sort of the structure of actually um, making progress. And um, does it make sense to have an ESG committee? And I guess uh, perhaps a question also from our side. If so, how does that committee collaborate, work with, support, Remco, the audit committee. Um, Julie, can I start with you on that question, please? Yeah, I mean, I think that we see this, um, chapter zero sees this whole issue as a, it's a board issue. It's a genuinely, um, the whole board has to be focused on how a company adapts to the challenges around the climate. Um, but there's no doubt that, particularly for the bigger companies, that committees work very well to do deep dives into in all sorts of different things um, and so uh, for many companies having a, a specialized committee that deals with sustainability or ESG gives them an extra area of focus just as they might have a risk committee which would have a, uh, a, a different focus and then that can feed back up into the board but I don't think um, just looking at the question that was on the screen I don't think that um, separates this out from the remuneration committee. The remuneration committee has to deal with all aspects of executive pay and now we have to go actually quite a long way down the organisation in terms of looking at pay structures as well. So I think there is no doubt that, that we are responsible on the Remco for establishing how best to weave these sorts of targets into our overall pay structure. Um, and as Susan says, there will be lots of different ways of doing that and um, lots of different approaches to measurements and different stages in the journey. But it, it is, to, in, to my mind, it is absolutely a Remco issue to work out how to incentivize the directors in particular, but the entire executive team around fulfilling what's required to, to tackle this issue. Thank you, Julie. Um, I'd like to move on to a different type of question. Uh, this is a question um, about um, conflicts of interest or when one set of targets collide or one objective collides with another objective. Um, and the examples that are given, uh, potential conflicts between financial targets and ESG targets. And I guess that probably implies sort of short term and long term as well. Um, and then a second, perhaps more technical point, when your defined targets are not the same as the criteria that have been adopted by a rating agency or an investor um, that has formed its own index and, 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 and um, metrics for, um, for ESG and, and for the environment. Um, Susan, can I kick off with you on, on just dealing with these, conf these tensions um, uh, about setting those targets and perhaps your experience from some of the different um, boards that you've sat on and sectors that you've operated in? Yeah, sure. I mean, there's no question in my mind uh, that there will be tensions. And, and I think we've set the scene for that, uh, you know, indirectly with what we've been saying here with regards to... Um, uh, the need for change, the need for judgment, um, and the need to use discretion one way or the other. I think um, uh, Julie highlighted this very well at the beginning in terms of the business models needing to change to deal with the transition to sustainable business. Um, there will be trade-offs to be made, but it's about having clarity of what that long-term uh, target is that you're trying to achieve that will enable you to make the trade-offs. I'm not saying they're going to be easy, but they will need to be enabled. I don't think that's necessarily a REM specific discussion though. I do think that that uh, comes back a bit to what Julie just said. It is a board decision because um, the REM is really there to advise on how best to incentivize execs to achieve the strategic priorities. But if the strategic priorities entail a trade-off between, um, tr let's call them for sake of uh, it, putting them where they've been today, traditional, targets versus the targets that we need to achieve over a shorter period of time, um, 
it, it is a board decision as to where the trade-off gets made because there will be potential negative impact. The only thing I can say is there are now already a number of examples where companies have made those uh, negative financial trade-offs. In other words, for uh, an item which needed additional investment and then you know, trickled down in a negative way financially. And these companies are no longer, either that's already been built into the share price or the share price is not really dipping as a result of that. So I think the, t the times are changing on that and the traditional trade-off isn't as traditional as we, we think anymore. It's actually, you know, if you don't take the trade-offs, you're gonna get the hit. Thank you. And, um, and I think probably one point to add there is also the articulation and the narrative around what you're doing. Um, the communication is, is, is critically important. I, I'd like, we have, we've got quite a lot of questions. So I, I, um, um, I'm going to move to um, a question about the supply chain, which I think is a very good one. I'm going to ask um, Richard to, to address this. Have you managed to get your suppliers and outsource providers, customers, clients to join you in this journey? And what KPIs um, have you developed? And is this also linked to senior executive remuneration? Um, so Richard. Yeah, well, <clears throat> There's, um, it's a tricky one. So the answer is we're on a, we are on a journey with our suppliers. <clears throat> There's no doubt about that. And we have, um, we have a, an excellent chief sustainability officer who covers many, many areas, but one of them is um, the supply chain and one of them is the, um, uh, the, the, the very important issue of um, carbon emissions within that supply chain. And I think it's fair to say as an organization, we definitely focus on it. In terms of the way in which that might bite through our remuneration committee, then we definitely look at scope one, two, and three emissions. And, and obviously three is the relevant one. And we definitely take uh, progress on three very much into account. And I think, you know, probably like a lot of organizations, it, you know, it starts with procurement and what we're looking for and the extent to which uh, suppliers we're looking to procure with um, can actually meet the sort of uh, emissions targets um, that, that we're actually looking for. And then that way we get into a partnership with them um, and work towards um, some sort of desired end. But it's definitely a feature, but uh, it's a big topic, and it's, I think it's fair to say, with us, uh, real work in progress. Thank you, um, uh, Richard. Um, I have another question for Richard um, about independently auditing progress towards targets, and um, how have you found procuring such services? So the, the sort of the, the I guess the, the independent verification and assurance around the targets and the progress towards those, those targets. Um, any further comments that you'd be able to make there, Richard? Well, um, we haven't, there is a whole debate about whether, um, uh, and this, this is a very big debate about whether we should uh, seek um, as companies, as the corporate sector, some sort of broader uh, audit of our sustainability um, credentials and what we what we state, and I, I, I you know I think that's a very very important debate. Um, we don't, as such, have um, independent uh, audit of our Remco targets. What we do have is um, a very careful look at those and the underpinning of those in the Remco. Um, and, you know, obviously a requisite degree of trust between uh, Remco members and the executive uh, that, that, you know, we'll understand the, the good and the bad aspects of performance. Uh, so I don't, at the moment, I don't think we have, the, we have um, particularly got um, independent audit as such. When we, when we went through our science-based um, target process, we definitely submitted ourselves there to a level of, a high level of uh, scrutiny, and if you like, audit. Um, but, I, I, you know, I think it's up to us 
as to how we then report that and the quality of our uh, internal systems and reporting that. Thank you, Richard. I have got an eye on the time and I've got a couple more questions I would like to get in. One is um, I, um, <laughs> about the role of investors. Um, I, I might tone the question down a little bit, um, but uh, BlackRock aren't the only investors um, who are active in this space. And I, I, maybe a question for Julie. Um, which institutional investors do we see as playing a, an active role in helping to shape and even sort of guide and support boards to a certain extent, as well as call to account in this area of both climate change and uh, the KPIs uh, that they're expecting to see. But also perhaps um, the extent to which companies are educating investors, um, because it, it's a learning curve for all. And I'd just be interested in your perspective on that iterative process of is it, dri is it being driven by investors? Is this being driven by companies who are helping to shape the, the views of investors? Julie. It's interesting because it's changed dramatically since we st first started working on this prior to starting off with Chapter Zero because we looked at the investor view quite a lot then and Larry Fink had already started with his, his first letter, or oh, it may not have been the first, but the first one that got the big traction. So um, we could see that investors were getting interested. But there was quite a lot of uh, gap between the stated intention of investors and the, what companies were receiving from the fund managers in terms of messaging. You know, it didn't seem to be a very consistent set of messages. I think it's moved on hugely. And the idea of ESG investing and responsible investing has become much more mainstream, which has helped it. So it's not now a niche activity. Um, the ones that we work most closely with who've been most active, I think, would be um, legal in general. So LGIM, um, they have got, the, I think, the strongest ESG offer. And, and so they're really putting their customers' money where their mouth is on that. But they also, you know, they put out some very powerful messaging. Aviva are obviously out there, um, and Steve Waygood is one of the most well-known responsible investors on, in the UK landscape, and so we work with them. Hermes have always been very concerned about all things to do with compliance, and so they are, um, are active. And then you've got Saracen, who are taking some fairly strong lines, and I mean, Saracen are the ones, as you will know, who have said that they, there should be a gateway for all variable pay, so that rather than having a percentage target attached to uh, some sort of environmental climate um, ambition, that the climate ambition should override all aspects of variable pay. And if you don't meet the target, you don't get anything. So that's a, that's a pretty far out um, direction of travel, if you like. So I think it's growing fast, Gillian, and becoming more powerful. But just one other point, if I may, on that, because interesting feedback I got this morning from an initiative we're involved in with the CBI, which is called Goal 13. Goal 13 is obviously the SDG goal on climate. Um, and the feedback we got from 100 interviews with companies was that they are now feeling the customer, whether it be B2B or B2C, the customer um, power and driver is becoming more powerful for them than the investor driver, which was a surprise to me because I actually thought the investors would be, uh, you know, cracking the whip more strongly. But it's customers who are beginning to take up that that slack. If Interesting. Like. Yeah. So maybe the retail investors are also shaping the pension funds. Are also so so, so maybe yeah. there's a virtuous a cycle there. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Um, Susan, I believe you wanted to just add something there. Yes, um, I, I, I actually did write an answer on this one. I, for me, um, it's not about good guys versus bad guys, with one exception, and this is a very personal terminology, is you know, BlackRock has done more to shift the level of urgency on this topic uh, than any single group. And the reality is, as a group of businesses, again, we've made big shifts in 18 months, but we are so far away from where we need to be to make this shift a positive one that... Anyone who can do that is, in my mind, a good guy. Whether they're the only investors, no, absolutely not. And in fact, the one thing I would say, too, is um, if you don't have, and I'm big on this, you've got to have this strategy. If you don't have this strategy, the investors will give you a shopping list of things that you have to report on. And actually, we don't have the time, the bandwidth, or even the need to do that. 
and choosing, understanding your strategy so that you know what to report on and then push back and saying, no, that's going to be increasingly um, an important aspect just to save the, you know, the fabric of the company at the moment because you won't be able to do everything. So no, no good guys yet, but certainly heroes in my mind is anyone who can ex pick up the pace of change on this topic. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Um, and, and I think that description we often um, think in terms of being on the back foot or being on the front foot and we see a lot of companies on the back foot just being overwhelmed by disclosure requirements as opposed to having a sense of materiality and 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 stating the narrative and 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 being able to bring stakeholders um, with them yeah we are drawing to a close and I'd like to just turn to each of the panel just for a, a word of advice for Remco chairs on the on the call um, in, in terms of uh, maybe not getting it, it right because getting it right is very difficult, but, but the contribution um, to be made through Remco. Um, so Richard, perhaps first of, um, from, from you, just, just uh, a last word of advice. Well, I think um, maybe a couple of words, but one is, is I, I think a lot of the sustainability issues we've talked about are a board issue. I actually don't think that there are an ESG or even a REM issue. So I think the board must articulate both a strategy, uh, a sustainability approach that underpins that. And then, of course, it is down to REMCO to tr translate that into the detail. And I, I think it was Susan who said it, but, but obviously we are in at the moment from a REMCO point of view, we're in a let's get started, let's put something in place and let's see how it really does work and let's keep it constantly under review. And, you know, things may have to change, but unless we do start, then you know, we're not going to get anywhere. Thank you. And, and Julie, from your side. Yeah, I think what I would say would be be really clear as a committee and as a chair what you're incentivizing and, and how you believe it should be done and then hold fast to that because I think historically I mean I've been showing Remco's for 20 years and and we get sort of slightly beaten from pillar to post by investor perceptions at, at any one time about what's good and what isn't good and this particular context I don't think investors actually know any more than we know about what's good so I think we just have to set out what we think is right be really thoughtful about it and then make that case um, and not not be not waver from it and then give it the first year and see how we get how we go this is Susan's point you have to be flexible and keep moving on but it takes a bit of determination and courage to stick to your guns on this one and and actually probably also engagement as well the communication and the engagement of with course. investors Absolutely. yes yes thank yeah. you yeah and Susan, a last word from your side. Yeah, last word. I was, it, you, you get the choice of either repeating what others have said or not. And I'm trying to come up with something which is more meaningful than what's already been said. But I just leave it on, you know, show me the plan. Without a plan that is agreed to at board level, you're moving the deck chairs uh, with regards to KPIs because, and you're pushing water uphill with regards to the exec. So with that, you've got to have a plan and it doesn't have to be the perfect one, but without it, um, you, you're not going to get to the KPIs. So show me the plan. That's what I'd leave you with. And some great sort of metaphors, pushing water uphill and, and rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. So um, both very powerful yeah, for right. making the point. <laughs> um, ben, could we move to the next chart, please? So really just to wrap up today's um, webinar, I'd like to... Um, thank our contributors very much. And, um, you know, we're certainly seeing that this linkage of decarbonisation to remuneration is becoming increasingly important. Um, it's a sharp learning curve uh, for Remco chairs. Uh, the pace of change is fast and um, uh, absolutely not static and expectations are developing as well. And as all our speakers have said today, you know, the metrics must um, demonstrate commitment inspire confidence and be capable of evolution um, and I think um, the need for strategy as the linchpin uh, and the role of the board uh, in, 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 in really um, driving this has come through very very clearly today and so just to wrap up 
Um, please do, for those um, participants who are not yet um, Chapter Zero members, uh, please do contact Chapter Zero. Uh, it's a great source and repository of frameworks um, and, and, and guidance for thinking on, on this. And certainly, if Fidelio can support your board through search, evaluation, and development uh, to be fit for the future, and climate change is clearly an important strand, um, if not the gateway, as Julie said, uh, please do get in touch. I'd like to thank our speakers today. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, and also our, our audience for the great questions. And we will be circulating the charts. Uh, we'll receive, send those out in the next couple of days. Thank you all very much indeed. Thank you. Bye-bye.